Um, we're going to start out in First Chronicles chapter 21, so if you want to um, start with verse 1. Uh, I had a unique experience today. I was uh, here, and because we got one, one of the, we had clogged toilets, I was up here, and, and uh, when I did my business, I came out and I heard somebody in the church. I kept hearing these noises, so I walked back and there was somebody in the, fortunately it was the one, the toilet that wasn't clogged. <laughs> I did get one working. Anyway, kind of standing there waiting because, uh, you know, I'm just not not normal to have somebody walking in, although I, ha I do have walk-ins. And uh, so the guy came out, and he was young, and I said, what are you doing here? He said, well, I, I came in to get something to read and figured I'd use the bathroom. Are you the proprietor here? <laughs> I said... Yeah, I'm the pastor. Well, I started sharing his heart. He said, well, I've, I've sinned. And he said some things about his sinning against his mom and uh, some other things that he was doing. And so I, I said, uh, you know, let's sit down and have a conversation. So uh, we did. I asked him if he if he, uh, you know, did drugs. He said, well, I, I smoke weed. I said, well, you know, according to the Bible, that's drug. Uh, and uh, I said, uh, so I, I started talking with him. He said, you know, I got some major issues. So I asked him if he was going over to this place over here. It's kind of like a daycare for people like him or anybody, you know, and uh, so we got to talking. I asked him, uh, you know, have you ever heard the gospel? He said, I don't know, and so I started explaining the gospel to him, and and uh, he said he went to a church somewhere in Havelock, and I said, so you've never heard the gospel, and he said, no. So I explained the gospel to him, and I said, you know, I I don't want to make you do this. I don't want, you know, I, I'm not here to twist your arm or make you feel guilty or anything like that. I'm just telling you, you're a sinner. And it doesn't matter whether you quit doing drugs or you quit doing this or you quit doing that. You're still a sinner. You're, you're still under a, a, a death sentence. And I said, but that's what Jesus came to set us free from. And uh, his name is uh, Nico. And uh, so he sat and I said, well, you know, I can lead you in a prayer if you believe in your heart. And so I explained all that to him. And I said, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, the Bible declares that you will be saved. He said, yeah, I'd, I'd like that. So he prayed with me accepted Jesus as his Savior, and then went on his merry way. I told him, well, you know, you need to get in a church where they're going to teach you the Bible, where they're going to pray for you, and they're going to love you. I said, you need to get into a place where, you know. And so I gave him a, a How to Be Born Again little booklet and a Bible. And so that was kind of a unique little I don't usually get walk-ins, as Thomas told me later. I don't have, you know, fish jumping into the boat normally. <laughs> Which, it's funny that he used that, because uh, those are the verses that God gave me when he called me to be a pastor, was, you know, Peter catching fish on the other side of the boat. So, fisher of men. So, anyways... Uh, Pray for him, if, if you remember. Pray for Nico. I mean, he seems like he was maybe 20. 
you know, and, uh, but, you know, as he walked out the door, I said, Lord, you know, if somebody gets born again, it's your business, it's not mine. I did my part. You know, if he gets saved, he gets saved because you, 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 know, you had a transaction with him. So, anyway, it was kind of a, I don't know, something I didn't expect, you know, being shocked. <laughs> Somebody wandering around the church, you know, and my initial reaction was, get out. <laughs> I didn't say that to him, but that <coughs> ran through my mind. And God, so, you know, obviously was saying, no, I want him to be here. So, anyway. Um, so, we are in First Chronicles 21. We're, we're going through warfare in a manner of, of speaking. And uh, tonight is... Uh, just kind of a, a, a zero, a focused um, look at, at that and the consequences thereof and also how God will use that um, according to Romans chapter 8, how he works all things together for the good. And so uh, we're going to close up with that, that thought. Because sometimes uh, we wonder how, you know, how can God make good on this when he seems to, you know, be so critical, then that's, that will come out tonight. So if you're with me, uh, verse 1, chapter um, 21 of First Chronicles says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So, if you read uh, Second Kings, the aspect, it doesn't mention Satan. Uh, it just says David was moved to number the people. But right here it tells us that it was Satan who influenced David to number the people. And they were never supposed to do that because they were not supposed to rely upon their army. They weren't supposed to number their army so they could say, oh, wow, I got a big army. I'm ready to go out to war. Yeah, because God knew that was the tendency of mankind to say, wow, I got so many chariots. I got so many horsemen. I got this. I got that. You know, guys are notorious video game players or, you know, whatever. We're just notorious to get our armies together and count them and say, wow, I got this many of these and that and those, and I'm guilty of that, certainly in my past. And so David sins against God, but it was Satan who was behind it. It doesn't tell us how he did that, but I can speculate that he planted a thought in his mind. And he said, you know what? Wouldn't be bad for you to know how much big of an army you have. Wouldn't be no big deal. And maybe David made some compromises and thought, ah, you know, I mean, the guy had 32 wives. Uh, the Bible says he shouldn't, kings were not supposed to multiply wives. Well, what is that, four times eight? That's multiplication. Or, you know, you can divide it up and multiply, you know, two times 16, or whatever the case may be, that's not what he was supposed to do. And unfortunately, God allowed him to do that, seemingly, you know, winking and nodding as though that was okay. But it brought consequences, especially for Solomon, because Solomon, you know, ended up, as we went through Proverbs and we understood Solomon went on to uh, um, take that to a very extreme position and uh, with wives that he should have never married to begin with. You know, he was doing it for commerce, not for love, you know. And uh, so anyway, that's the beginning of the story. I'm going to avoid what Joab did here because it's really... <laughs> 
Joab went out to do what David wanted to be done. Uh, and after they did that, uh, in verse 14, um, actually 13, it says, David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. God had given him three choices about being defeated, you know, uh, a famine, and then just throwing himself down at God's mercy. And so he said, you know, I know God's merciful. I know what I'm dealing with there, so I'm just going to choose the mercy of God or God's nature and God's character. Um, and God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. Get this. God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem, the city where God would later put the temple because of David's sin. As he was destroying, the Lord looked uh, and relented of the disaster and said to the angel who was destroying it, Is enough. Now restrain your hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. Then David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. So David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people, that they should be plagued. Now, up to this point in time, there's 70,000 men that have died in Israel. And it tells us that God wanted to clean the, flushing, the threshing floor. I'm going to use that as an example because... Uh, It was just God's way of dealing with Israel. And it doesn't tell us about the 70,000 guys. It doesn't tell us their sins or anything else. But 70,000 men died. And David is here going, man, this should fall on me. It shouldn't fall on them. It should fall on my family. And there, there's the heart of David. You know, he understood his sin. Um, so in verse 18 it says therefore the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite the Jebusites were the owners of this city before David conquered it under Joab they David hadn't dwelt there for a long time up to this point in time. And why he allowed Ornan to continue to live, we don't know. But Ornan had been the king of this place, and he was allowed to live and keep private property. Um, so uh, the Lord told him to go get the threshing floor of this guy, Ornan. And so David does what God wants him to do. There's something specific about this threshing floor that God wants us to know and wanted the children of Israel to know. Um, so David went up at the word of Gad, which, which he had spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him, hid themselves, but Ornan continued threshing wheat. So he's actually doing that. So David came to Ornan, and Ornan looked 
and saw David, and he went out from the threshing floor and bowed before David with his face to the ground. Then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at full price, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it for yourself, and let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also have... Uh, I, I also give you the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat of the grain offering. I give it all. Then David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price. For I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. Once again, we see David's character. He, he, he doesn't, you know, he, he, he's going to sacrifice to the Lord, all of it. Nobody's going to rob him of, of um, his sacrifice. So David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. That's quite a bit of money. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord and he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of the burnt offering. So the Lord commanded the angel and he re returned his sword to its sheath. And at that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering which Moses had made in the wilderness were at that time at the high place in Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. So it's kind of an obscure <laughs> story in one respect, although it is, you know, passed over. <laughs> but when you <coughs> consider that 70,000 men died, um, that's a lot of people to be, and they were killed by the angel of the Lord. They were not killed by anybody else. This was judgment. It was judgment against Israel. And... Uh, you know, it doesn't give us a specific reasons for this judgment. It doesn't, you know. And again, uh, where the Bible is silent, it's probably best that we stay silent. But uh, this is not the first time this place has been pointed out by God. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis 22, verse 1. So let me ask you, as you're uh, all thinkers, students of the Bible, what do you do on a threshing floor? You separate the wheat from the chaff. You separate that which is what? Valuable, retainable, edible, in this case. You separate that out. You put it in a pile over here. And the whole idea is you do this on the top of a hill, so you have a threshing rake, if you would have it, and you throw up the grain after you have run over it with either a stone or a cattle or something like that where you break up, you know, the outside husk so you get at the, the wheat kernel or corn kernel or whatever it is. And so you get a windy day, and you throw it up in the air. Well, what happens to the seed? It falls over here in a nice pile. The wind carries it just a little ways. What happens to the chaff? It's driven away. 
Ultimately, if the chaff gets into a big pile, you burn it. You burn it up. You use it as fuel for fire. Uh, Jesus talked about that himself. So, um, so you have this threshing floor that has a, a very symbolic, uh, powerful story behind it. And that is that you have to crush the grain, crush the husk. You have to crush it to get at that which you want. Right? And everybody did this. I mean, if you read the book of Ruth, that's where she went to meet Boaz, was at a threshing floor. She laid down at his feet. Threshing floors can be good, but guess what? Threshing floors and that idiom uh, is also used in the Bible as a big negative for those who are going to be judged. It goes both ways. You're either wheat or you're chaff, okay? But in, in this, it tells us in Genesis, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Tells us Abraham was in Beersheba. It's a three-day journey, 60 miles. Took him three days to get there. And uh, Hebrews talks to us about this. It's speaking of death and resurrection. Abraham died. It killed him to do this. He was going to offer his son as a burnt sacrifice. That's what God wanted. But he wanted us to see a picture. He wanted us to see a picture of what he was going to do a couple thousand years later when his son was on Mount Moriah at Golgotha and his son was sacrificed. What kind of pain did that produce for the father? It's the first place in the Bible. I've mentioned this before. It's the first place in the Bible you see the word love. It's love from a father to a son. You know, I mean, love is seen, but that word is not used, except in this place where he said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, and offering him as a burnt sacrifice. That's totally consumed by fire. Totally given over. And Abraham knew that God was not in the child sacrifice or human sacrifice. So he has a dilemma. If I obey God, what's going to happen? And he's the one that's going to stab him. He's the one that's going to light the fire. He's the one that's going to watch him burn. Obviously not as a live sacrifice he was going to. But he had to go through that whole process, believing somewhere along the line that God would have to cause Isaac to rise from the dead because he had already said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. So either God's a liar or God has another plan but it still doesn't alleviate the pain or the question marks. So he comes to this place of Moriah, and uh, um, this place becomes um, a place that God wants the world to know about. Uh, Zion means, uh, you know, and Jerusalem is called Zion. Um, you know, they, even today, they call uh, Jewish people Zionists. And what they're talking about is they're into Jerusalem. They, they believe Jerusalem is their capital, so they're Zionists. They're not just, you know, we'll settle for second best. No, they want their temple. They want restored 
worship the way it is according to the law. And uh, so Zion means a monument. It means something that is uh, very visible. Um, it is uh, um, something that, that you can't not see. And so that's the whole idea is that's why it's called Zion is the temple, the temple mount, uh, the place where the altar will be, as we will find out, is um, the general vicinity of where Jesus would be sacrificed. He would be sacrificed on Mount Moriah, but not necessarily exactly where this, this um threshing floor of Ornan is, because the threshing floor where Ornan uh, is, is going to become the place of the holy place. So if you want to go with me to Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, um, It says, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. So what happened at that place of Ornan? Intercession. Intercession. David did what? He interceded for the people of Israel. And so it became a place where God's mercy uh, was seen and where God's justice was appeased. And so that would forever be connected with the holy place, which is where the children of Israel, the high priest went in once a year to offer three different sacrifices and offer the blood on the altar or on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, and where Israel's sins was put away for a year. But when that all happened, the, the, the priest himself needed to be cleansed because he was a sinner. And so he had to offer a sin offering for himself called the the Day of Atonement. Uh, some use uh, that and break it up and say the, the, the Day of One-ment, become one with God. It's where you, it's actually called in the Jewish culture face to face. It was the only time when the high priest got to go into the Holy of Holies and meet face to face with God. Now we know there's other appearances of God beyond the holy place, you know, where God graciously, but it's all a picture. The whole temple thing and everything there is a picture of what Jesus did. It is. It's a picture that Jesus went to the true throne of God and offered his blood there so that we would be what? Atoned for but our sins were not put away for a year. They were put away forever. Okay, so it's a picture. But Jesus was offered, as I said, I believe Friday night or Sunday night. He was offered outside of the city, but it's still Moriah. I mean, if you had a clear shot from where Jesus was crucified to the temple, you would see the temple. It's not that far away, but he was, he was offered outside. But this tells us right here that is what? Moriah tells us specifically that it's the place that David purchased this threshing floor. And that's what goes on there. You're either accepted, right? So you're keeper wheat, or you're rejected, which means... 
your chaff for the wind. It's a, it's a place where God does both. Literally, he does both. Acceptance and also rejection. If you don't come by faith, you're rejected. If you do it by religion, you're rejected. But if you come by faith, then guess what? You're accepted because you're doing it according to what God has commanded, right? And so uh, a threshing floor can be a blessing and can be judgment in the Bible. So go to Psalm chapter 1. And it's rather, rather interesting that God starts in Psalm 1 with a picture, in a sense, of, uh, we'll start with verse 4. So he, he tells the benefits of those who walk with the Lord. But then in verse 4, he says, the ungodly are not so but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. What goes on in all the things that God has described? In the Old Testament it was what? The judgment fell upon those animals that were sacrificed and taken behind the curtain, and the blood was... Seven times, three times seven, was put on the Ark of the Covenant. Take away the sins of the nation, uh, the sins of the priest. I can't remember the other ones. but uh, And so what was that all about? Those animals took the judgment of God, gave their blood. It's the picture they could never take away sin because they weren't equal to a human being. They were not moral agents. They were costly, but they were not moral agents. It was later the moral agent, Jesus Christ, the perfect man, who did what? Took our judgment, the crushing of the wheat, so that we could be saved and not what? Be the chaff so that we would not be the chaff. And I know you may say, well, you're stretching that, buddy. Well, let's look at a few more. Psalm 35, verses 4 and 6. And David's writing this. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. Now what happened? Uh, actually, in... in Second Kings, it actually specifies that this angel that talked to Jesus was the angel of the Lord, which would be Jesus himself, pre-incarnate, would be. And so what is David doing? I don't know when this psalm was written, but I have a feeling it was after the threshing floor incident. <laughs> and he's saying, Lord, you go get them like you're going to get me, like you got Israel. Go get them. Go wipe them out, but don't stop. Let your angel wipe them out, my enemies. That's pretty bold, but he has a good memory, right? Because he knows God stopped the judgment against him and against the nation of Israel by the offering. He's basically saying, God, no offering for these people. No offering, no sin forgiveness. Get them. Get them. And that's Old Testament. We don't do that stuff in the New Testament. We pray for our enemies, right? But in their day, uh, 
That was not the way that they dealt with things. Turn with me to Malachi 4, 1 and 2. Or Malachi, if you want to call it that. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. And he goes on and talks about the wicked. So Malachi says when God's judgment comes, the people that are wicked will suffer as the chaff and be thrown into the oven. I mean, the day in which we're living, I haven't watched the news for two days. I'm, I'm, I don't want to watch the news. I, I have in a sense already what's coming. So I don't want to get mad and frustrated. And so I just, I'll just pray keep my head in the word because it's the safest place for me to be and look forward to what God wants to do in these, these days in which we are living. And I believe he wants to do some, some good stuff, but I also know it's going to be a trial for the church. We'll talk about that at another point in time. But nobody's going to get away. Nobody. Nobody's going to pull one over on God. I like that, and sometimes it scares me, you know. But that fear is a good fear. I know he loves me. I know he died for me. I know that, you know, he chose me. I know a lot of different things, and I believe them all. But I also know that without grace... I, I don't have a hope. Um, and so that, that fear of the Lord tightens up that, that what, what I call sloppy agape, you know. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> it's a safe place. It's a good place. It's not a public place. It's a private place. So don't ever do your devotions in public. Beat yourself in public. Don't do that. You, you take care of business between you and the Lord in your prayer closet or, you know, windshield time or whatever the case may be. Because he'll cleanse you, he'll wash you, so that when you get in public, you can glorify him and, you know, don't. Don't do it in public. I hear too many people do it in public, and it it upsets me. It's like, nah, you you need to go home and pray these kind of prayers, you know. And you certainly don't need to be saying we when you're, you know, being critical of yourself. Don't add me into the, your we. <laughs> I got my own eyes that I deal with privately, but don't bring me into your we. I, you know, that, that, that bothers me to no end. Sorry. I'm venting. Yes, you are. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 15. You guys should all know this. 15 to 17. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to, the, to all, 
I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Who is this? The fire-breathing preacher John the Baptist, right? And, but he does say something. He says, hey, yeah, Jesus came, grace and truth, but if you don't respond, this is the outcome of that lack of response towards who he is. He's got a winnowing fan. And he's going to clean out his flesh, threshing floor. And all the keepers he's going to put in his barn. But everybody else is going to end up being chaff. You're going to be blown in the wind, or wind and, and burned in the fire. And so once again, you focus on the sacrifice. Jesus paid, right, so that I don't have to go. I become chaff, that I become wheat. It's another one of those pictures where he says, hey, you're valuable, you're coming in my barn, you're coming in my house, you're mine. I want to keep you, right? Just another one of those, those pictures, if you would have it. Luke 22, 31 and 32. And the Lord said to Simon, Indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Thank God for the intercessory prayers of Jesus Christ. He prays for us. Do you know that? He prays for us. Sometimes he gets other people to pray for us. I heard today I talked to somebody and they asked about where somebody was in the church and said that God was laying that person on their, their hearts. Always like that, you know. But uh, he wanted to sift Peter. Once again, the threshing floor, right? So, but he wanted to sift him as wheat, not as chaff. Couldn't take his salvation. Could just make his life miserable. That's a comforting thought, you know? And, uh, you know, that's... Uh, so go with me to Daniel. It's kind of out of order, but Daniel chapter 2, verses uh, 34 through 36. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron clay and broke them in pieces. Up to this point in time, Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream, uh, a vision about a statue that's made out of, uh, well, four or five different types of material. Um, the initial is gold, the head, Babylon, uh, the arms, and uh, upper body were silver. Uh, the midsection is bronze. The legs are iron. But then you have these ten toes of iron and clay. And uh, so 
And it tells us right here what is going to happen to this image. And it's about ready to happen. This image is present as we speak in many different ways. It's present. But it tells us uh, um, that there's a stone cut out without hands. And you can find that in Psalm 118. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. I mean, that, that is an idiom that follows throughout the Bible. It says, Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck that image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. There's true dominion theology right there. Jesus comes back and he does what? He destroys the semblance of these godless nations that continue to have an influence today. They do. Many different ways. And people have not let go of it. Um, so, a step back to the beginning. David sins against God, Satan tempts him. So you would think that God would just slap Satan and say, what are you doing? Well, in a manner of speaking, he was going to slap him. Because on that same Mount Moriah, he was going to do him a death blow through Jesus Christ. It would not be at the, you know, the threshing floor of Ornan. Some try to put that, those two together. It doesn't fit because that's the temple. It's the holy place of the temple. And Jesus was what? Crucified outside the wall of Jerusalem. But God used that for good. Painted a picture. He started the picture with Abraham. Take your son, your only son whom you love, to a mountain that I will show you. Hebrews tells us three-day journey, death and resurrection. It's a picture. It's a picture of what a father would do later at Mount Moriah when he offered his son and he passed judgment upon the son so he would not pass judgment on us. The Bible says that all things work together to the good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So go with me to Romans chapter 8. This is the good part of Romans. I mean, it's all good, but this is, this is like going to the ultimate dessert bar, you know, for helping after helping after helping, you know. I heard a, um, a, a man that became a pastor, his father was in the, the real estate business and on his uh, desk, he had this verse. It was sitting there facing him. So whenever things didn't work out, <laughs> He got to read the verse and say, okay, all things work together to the good. When he didn't, the deal didn't go through or, you know, something else happened. Um, yeah, it'd be a good verse to, you know, post on the wall, uh, put it in a big poster, put it on your refrigerator. That'd be a good place. Or maybe in your bathroom. When you might be sitting there, it's right there in front of you. Yeah, I, sorry. So, verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That word for called is an effective call. 
as in the Greek language. It's effective. When God calls somebody, it's not, uh, you know, well, maybe. No, it's an effective call. For whom he foreknew, when did he know you? In eternity past. It's when he foreknew you and me. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He, Jesus, being the firstborn among many brethren. That's who we are. We're brethren. We're family. Uh, This is Calvinistic at its best, if you want to say. He predestined us. God had forethought. I don't have a problem with that. But I also know that there's human responsibility involved in everything that God does. You can't just, uh, I read a book many, many years ago um, about Charles Finney. Uh, Charles Finney was, uh, uh, became a believer about the time of uh, the War of 1812. We were fighting against the British. Uh, you might remember the, the Star Spangled Banner came out of that. Fort McHenry, Patrick Henry, or whatever, Baltimore. And, uh, but uh, Charles Finney grew up in a wealthy home, and he was a lawyer. And so he had nothing to do with God, although religion was all around and Christianity was all around, perceived Christianity. Well, he finally got born again. And he got filled with the Spirit, and God called him. And he went to a man that went to a a church somewhere in the Northeast, probably New York was where his his, uh, ministry grounds were. And he went to the man and asked the man if he was saved. And the man said, how can I know? He said, if God called me and God has chosen me, then I'm saved. And if not, then he's like, well, why do you go to church? Well, I, I don't know, you know. But I surely don't know whether I'm saved or not. And it struck Finney. And he's like, That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you can make a choice to choose Jesus, right? And so he was flabbergasted by this man's response. And and our forefathers in that area uh, became so Calvinistic that they stopped preaching. They stopped doing anything. They were just like, oh, well, we're so Calvinistic that, you know, God's in control. And I I find this with some people that I know, that they never ask God for anything. They just run around in theological circles. Oh, well, God, you're in charge, and God, you're in control, and God, I don't measure up, but I thank you, God. You know, and it's like, man, get to the rubber meat in the road. Ask for something, because that's what the Bible says. Ask, seek, and knock. If you don't ask, you're not going to receive anything. God, that's how God works. Ask. Lift people up. Yeah. And much of it I find to be that this place is very Calvinistic. Go to Church Row. They're all Calvinistic. You know? And it's like, well... I believe in a degree of Calvinism, but at the same time, does God choose somebody against their will? No, he doesn't. Can you love God without your will? If you can love God without your will, then you're not a free will agent. You're a robot. God didn't make robots. David could have said, yeah, give me your, give me the floor, give me the oxen, give me the yoke. I'll do this. 
because obviously God ordained it because you got it all right here and you're willing to give it to me. That's not what David said. He said, I won't give him anything that doesn't cost me. Right? That's why we serve him. We serve him because we love him. It costs us something. And if it's costless Christianity, is it isn't really Christianity. You have to ask yourself that question. Is it really Christianity? Or is it, I got a wacky theology where, you know, God's now obligated to me and I have no obligations towards them. Well, my... My son and my daughter are sitting right up here in the front row. They just got, how would you say it? Just got married. Oh, well, woman. You're, you're, you're stuck. You know, I don't have to do anything. I already loved you. How well would that go over? You can punch him now. No, just kidding. <laughs> wouldn't go over very well. It wouldn't. Right? Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way between us and God, and it doesn't work that way in human what? Human relationships, whether it be a husband and a wife or children and parents or whatever, has actions. As actions, has deeds. To those who love God, that's the qualifier here. Do you love God? That's what he says. Moreover, who in me predestined these he also called, invite. Whom he called these he also justified, whom he justified these he also glorified. Now, I had a, a good teacher that I used to listen to a lot, and he said this is, uh, this is like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, if you consider. Abraham was called. He delayed the first time, but he finally responded, went to Canaan, what would become the na nation of Israel. He went. Um, justified, who would that be? Maybe Jacob? Jacob seems to be the one guy that needed extra justification, you think? Heel catcher, you know? Manipulator? You know, God never says anything bad about him. Can't find it in the book of Genesis. Can't find it at all. Why? Because God loved him. He was looking forward to Jesus, and Jacob responded to God in faith. Not perfect faith, but in faith. None of these people responded in perfect faith, but they responded in faith towards God. Um, Glorified. Who would that be? You think maybe Joseph? Joseph went from rags to riches, right? From prison to what? The second ruler and all the most powerful kingdom in the world at that point in time. Anyway, I just throw that out at you. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So now that I've responded to Jesus, which is the richest gift that I could ever receive, will God withhold other blessings from me? Will he be stingy? No, he won't. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. Satan does his best to bring charges against us. Don't buy into it. Don't listen to him. Move on. You're justified in Jesus Christ. And if you fall short, God will let you know. But maybe like Jacob, he'll just move, continue to move and work in your life through grace. We get hung up on the law. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. I told you he was praying for you. Right? So who can condemn me if Jesus is standing at the right hand of the judge? The best lawyer in the world is what? My Savior. I don't know what he tells the Father about me, but it's good. It's good. He prays for me too. Satan likes to try to sift me and sift you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And I'll let you go through each of those. What do they mean? Tribulations cannot separate you from God. That's important as we approach the days ahead. Distress. Anybody ever, ever been distressed here? Yeah, we all have. It can't separate me from God's love. Persecution. Can't separate me from God's love. If it's done well, then they'll take my life and I'll go be with him. Can famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? Sword? What's the worst can happen? I die and go to heaven. Right? I know that seems so flippant, but it's not. It's a door. I go. I go to be with him. Now, I don't want to go before any of my kids. I've told the Lord that a lot of times. So it's like, you want to take somebody first, let me be first in line. You know, I won't be here with the sorrow and the pain of having my, you know, some of my kids depart before me. So he's never answered me or come to an agreement, but I've tried to get him to sign on the dotted line, but he just won't do it. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. How can he quote that? How is that possible? We've lived our whole lives, what? Fearing death. And now we've been set free from it, so I'm not rushing down the road to, you know, find myself in front of a firing squad, but at the same time, I can't lose. Neither can you. You cannot lose. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors, more than conquerors, not just conquerors, more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, which is demons, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. Nothing. Where do you get such a deal? From God. Himself. He loves us. So as I said to somebody today, and you've heard me say it if you've been around for any length of time, take a breath. 
of fresh air freely and stop fretting between you and God. Oh, I made a mistake and that's it. He's done with me. It's a fatal mistake. I got the wrong job. He'll work it for the good. You know? There's anything he doesn't work out. My finances are upside down. Yeah, that happens to a lot of us. He'll work it for good. It'll work it all for good. I encourage you to pray and ask for the good in your life and certainly for the good of others. So, okay, well, I bought an apple pie back there somewhere. So, if nobody wants it, I'll we'll take it and I'll go eat it all by myself and have a, a sugar high and then keel over. Yeah, so you better eat a piece. <laughs> Save me from myself.